So again, Merry Christmas. It's, it's Christmas Eve. And this evening, as we begin our celebration of this Christmas holiday, I want you to acknowledge one consistent and unique character, characteristic of God tonight. Just one thing I want you to think about. I want you to consider tonight that the reason that we celebrate Christmas is simply because God came to us. He gave himself to us. We did not find him. We did not discover him. God is not something we've created, at the very least in our imaginations, as some people might want to assume. And although we usually describe a person's conversion experience as saying that they came to Christ, that is somewhat inaccurate. And Jesus made it, he made it clear in John 15, 16, when he told the disciples, he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And I chose you, I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. You see, Christmas is a celebration of God taking the initiative. It's a recognition that one evening, 2,000 years ago, God came to man, came to this earth in the form of man. And it really is as simple as John 3, 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave, he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but would have eternal life. And throughout history, we can see that God has always made the first move. He's always taken the first step. Because you see, God is the great initiator. God is a giver. It's innate for him. And I want you to follow me through just a sampling of scriptures to see in, in reality just how true this is. Beginning at the beginning, in the book of Genesis, in the very beginning, it was God who initiated it all by giving life to Adam, the first man. God literally breathed life into that first lump of clay. And then it was God who very shortly after gave again. And this time he gave Adam a helpmate. Eve was a gift for that first man. And then when the two of them rebelled against him in the garden, by the way, he also gave them the garden. And they rebelled against him. He gave or he initiated or he provided a remedy from that very moment. He gave a promise of restoration because of that broken fellowship. Can you see how quickly? You can, you can quickly deduce a pattern that displays to us that God is a great gift giver. He is the great initiator. And later on in the book of Genesis, it's God who provides a son for the old patriarch, Abraham. Abraham's almost 100 years old. His wife is about 90 years of age. And they miraculously, through the promise of God, have a boy named Isaac. Then one day, Isaac is offered to God as a sacrifice. But again, his life is spared because God gave again. God provided, this time a ram in the bushes, as a substitute for that sacrifice instead of Isaac in order to spare the boy's life. And then Isaac later on marries. He has two sons, twins. We read about one is named Jacob. And his name literally meant heel grabber. But you know what? God is there and he's ready to yet give one more time. He gives Jacob a new name. Because he gave Jacob a new character. And his new name was Israel. A little while later we read about Moses. He's given into the hand of God by his mother. And yet she's going to receive him back. God's going to give Moses back to his own mother as she raises him for Pharaoh's daughter. And then God uses that leader, Moses, giving that leader, Moses, to the nation of Israel. After Moses, he gives him a priesthood who will intercede for them and for their sins. And then it's God again who provides the promised land for Joshua and the Hebrews. Moses didn't get to go in. He saw it from a distance. He saw the gift of God. Joshua goes in and actually takes it. When the people request a king so they can be like all the other nations, God provides King Saul and King David and King Solomon. God gave to the people time and time again. It's God who's always giving. It's God who's the great initiator. And following the kings and alongside the kings, God also provided prophets who would serve to call Israel back to righteousness. Anytime they'd stray, God would give a prophet. There's so many proofs, folks. There's so many proofs in the Bible that show us that God is this incredible gift giver. 
And then finally, as Galatians 4, 4 reminds us, and it's more in line with, with this Christmas time of year, it says, but when the time had fully come, speaking of this moment, speaking of our celebration of Christmas, when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law so that you and I might receive the full rights of sons. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so you see the trend here, as I told you from the beginning, is very, very obvious. The trend is very obvious. There is a consistent theme in Scripture because for, for centuries, really for millennia, God has been providing and it is His nature to make the first move. And because of this, I like to think of our God. Again, I'm, I've, rep I've repeated it so many times. I'm going to continue. God is the greatest gift giver ever. The ultimate proof is that he's given you and me a way of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. You know, there's a term that theologians use. They use it to describe God's grace for those who have become born again. Theologians call it prevenient grace. Meaning that it's an offer made or an offer that's initiated by one, in this case God, whereby any man or woman or, or child can receive eternal life just by responding to that offer. God says, here, I want you to have eternal life. And all that a person, a human being has to do is say, yes, I want that. That's provenient grace. It's an offer of grace. And it's provenient in that God, again, makes the first move. We don't go looking for him. And you know, it's been said, and I've, I've used this in the past, religion is man searching for God. Christianity is God searching for man. And God gives this gift of grace. God gives this gift in the form of an offer of salvation. God makes the first move. He initiates the offer, and then all we have to do, and most of us in, in this room, we know this, all we have to do is to respond. Amen? What a gift. What a gift. You see, the reason that we exchange gifts at this time of year, it's really not. It's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not about the, the Magi bringing gifts to the infant Jesus. It really, it really isn't. Their gifts were presented to indicate his royalty and his death. Rather, we exchange gifts, or we ought to exchange gifts, as a response to God's great generosity towards us. He first gave. I mean, forget for a moment the commercialization of this holiday. I want you to go beyond the surface celebrations and realize with me that we can now, you and I can freely give because we've freely received. And as you know, you know, this church, Praise Assembly, we're a very generous church in every way. And all year long, we practice the spirit of giving. We give to missions. We give our tithes. We give offerings. So many here in this church, given service to others and through various ministries all the year long. I believe that we give with the proper motivation too. But you know, we should give to those whom we love. And I think that's why we give. That's our motivation. We should be giving to those whom we love. And when we give, it should never be out of obligation, but rather it ought to be out of an appreciation for everything that God has done for us, not even just what that other person has done. And the reason that many people in the church are servants through the ministries of this church, you know why? It's not because, it's not because they feel obligated to serve those people because of who they are. It's because they feel an obligation because of who he is. Everything that God did for you Freely, freely, you have received. Freely, freely give. And so once again, let me tell you that he, our God, is the great gift giver. And ultimately, more than anything else, he desires that we would give ourselves to him. He, he desires that we'd present our bodies to him. Everything that we are is living sacrifices to him. That's what Paul wrote to the Christians in, 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 in Rome. That we ought to be as living sacrifices. That's the highest form of worship. Saying, God, I'm yours. I love you. The book of Hebrews tells us that God is not pleased with sacrifices and offerings. We read a lot about those in the Old Testament. But they didn't really, they didn't really do much for the heart of God. And, and, and what, what he really wants is obedience. And that means that there has to be a heart that's willing to love him and to serve him. In Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Jesus describes himself as one who's knocking on a door, waiting to be invited inside. 
And he says, and this is what he says. He says, here I am. I stand at the door. And the symbolism is the door of your human heart. I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him or fellowship with him and he with me. And today God is still making the first move. He is constantly knocking on the door of the hearts of people, wanting to be invited into their lives to be their God and Savior. He's given so much to us. He's the great gift giver. Could we not give him our hearts and our lives, even tonight, in the celebration of his birthday? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for who you are. That you are that great loving father. Lord, even, even your word, Jesus, you spoke it yourself. You talked about earthly fathers. And although earthly fathers aren't perfect. And, and Lord, even the scriptures refer to us as evil. By comparison to you, Lord God. But even us earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to our kids. How much more? Jesus, you said, how much more? Your heavenly father. And folks, tonight I want you to think about that fact. That we have a heavenly father who is an incredible gift giver. He loves us. And he'll give us any gift that we really need. But the one that, he, that matters most, the one that matters most to him, the one that matters most in our lives and for eternity, is the gift of his son, Jesus Christ. He was born in a manger as a baby grew into the appearance of a man, but he was the son of God and he was God incarnate, God in flesh. And he came to this world, not so much to live among men, because there were only about 30, 33 years, but really he came to this world to die for men. And by dying on that cross, he could take away the sins. He could take away the sins of any other human being if they would simply accept his gift of salvation. His gift of grace. And that's what he desires more than anything. And so as we're praying right now, let me ask you, do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And I don't mean do you go to church regularly. I don't mean that, you know, maybe you are just a C&E Christian, a Christmas and Easter Christian. No, we're not talking about church attendance. We're talking about a relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And if you have not done that, if you've never asked him to come into your heart, as I read a moment ago, he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's knocking on the door of your heart. He wants to come into your life. He wants to be your Lord. He wants to be your guide. He wants to help you. And you need to let him in because he's got great gifts. And I want us to pray right here. And I'm not asking you to repeat after me in prayer, but I'm going to pray for you. And if you feel so led tonight to ask him to come in, I want you to, I just hope and pray that you feel tonight that he's knocking the door of your heart saying, here I am. I want to come in. I want to live in you. I want to help you to live the right kind of life. I just pray you'll open that door and say, Lord Jesus, come in. And Father God, I pray that right now, Lord, that there may be open hearts here today. Lord, this evening, there may be someone who's, who's got, who doesn't yet know you, but, they, but, but somehow, just in this brief devotion tonight, that, that, that they sense that you are knocking on the door of their heart. And Lord, I pray that they would open that door and say, Lord Jesus, come into me. Come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you'd come in to my heart, that you'd forgive me of all sin, that you'd cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord, that you would, you would get, get rid of and bury my, my entire past. And Lord Jesus, that you would come in and be my Savior. Come into my heart and life tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And you know, if there even be one of you tonight, if, you've, if you can say you really said that prayer yourself and you felt it in your heart tonight, I'm going to hang around till the last person leaves. Take the time to come up to me and say, Pastor, I, I, I had never prayed that before. I've never asked Jesus to come into my heart before, but I did tonight. If you've done that tonight, let me know before we leave this evening. At this time, we're going to enjoy the lighting portion of tonight's service. And if you've already activated your glow stick, I want you to hide it in your purse or your pocket or <laughs> even sit under it. <laughs> Just... 
What did Jesus say? You're not supposed to hide your light. Well, right now you need to. Because we want to get this sanctuary as dark as possible and uh, you can start hitting lights. Hopefully, what I know we have a lot of electronics in the room, but I'm hoping that the only light we'll see in a moment might be my iPad. I may turn that off. And this little light right here, this little candle, we want to experience the symbolism. I want to begin tonight by experiencing the symbolism of how dark the world was when the one light Jesus came into the world. <coughs> you can turn off all the lights. <coughs> it's, it's pretty dark. I can't, I can't see any of you. I see exit lights. And you might be able to see me. How many, by a show of hands, how many can see me? Okay, that didn't work. Um, but you can see me because of this light. Incredible. If you read history, around the time of his birth, there was a Pax Romana, there was a peace of Rome. The empire had taken over so much of the known world that there weren't a lot of skirmishes going around because one physical temporal authority had all power. But the world was still very dark. The pagan way of life was very dark. People didn't care about each other. It was kind of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Every man for themselves. But the light came into the world. One light. And even John the Baptist said, I'm not the light, but the light is coming. And that light was Jesus. I've got a little bit more light that I'm going to add to this. If you'll excuse me. I'm going to try to dim this as much as I can. Because I do want to read this one passage. It's from the first chapter of John's gospel. And verse 4, it says, In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light that shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. And again, if you look at this one solitary light on the communion table, it really is quite bright in contrast to the amount of darkness in this room. If we were careful, we could. Every one of us could get up and, and make our way towards this light. I said carefully, but... It's hard to imagine that someone couldn't comprehend this light. Even if you're sitting in the back, maybe you can still get a little light out of this. You'd, you'd have to ignore this light. You'd have to choose to deny its existence. It's so, it is. It's so incredibly obvious in spite of its diminutive size. And this year, once again, we're doing something we did last year for the first time. The fire marshal has asked us not to use candles. And so we're going to use light sticks. And, and what I'd like to do is to break them and shake them symbolically as we'd pass a flame, one person after another, and as we do this, I want you to watch what happens when this light gets multiplied. And I love this part of the service because the light, it's going to spread from one person to another. And normally, again, if we had candles, I'd go to the people in the front rows and they begin passing out to the sides. But you know what's great about these light sticks? They're almost like candles. It takes a little while before they get all the way out to full brightness. So why don't we do that? Let's go ahead and break your light stick and just watch this place begin to light up. Break it and give it a shake. Look at how, I mean, that just, it just trans, transformed the place. I can see you now. Hey, you know what, too? I didn't do this last year. Can I get your picture? I, I really, I've got to get a picture. So, we'll mail it to the state fire official. i will be very happy. Thank you. But you know what it does? When you go from this one light that we saw before in this darkness, Jesus came into the world slowly, person by person, a few disciples, and then others began to follow him. Until, I mean, even the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000, he became renowned. But then they crucified him. He rose from the dead. And out of that one little light, that one small seed... What's transpired over the 2,000 years is incredible. 
In Matthew 13, it says this, He told them another parable, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all your seeds, he said, yet when it grows up, it's the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. I mean, imagine how small yeast is and yet the impact that it can have. And so Jesus, I believe, used that analogy of the mustard seed and of leaven to almost imperceptible items by themselves because they're so small. But over time, they become undeniable. And our analogy tonight is a cumulative effect of the light that we each hold in our hands, the faith and belief that we hold in our hearts. And so I want to encourage you in this year ahead with Jesus' words when he said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Can you hold it up? I mean, already you've got it in your lap and it, yeah, put it down for a minute. Put it, put it, put it in your lap. And it's like, boy, it got dark in here. But hold it up. I want us to do that in this year ahead. Yes. Amen? Let's let our light shine by our actions, by our behavior, by our love one for another. Jesus said that the whole world, others would know that we're his disciples by our love one for another. We need to let our light shine. Amen? Amen. Merry Christmas to every one of you. Now with the light that you have, let's stand together. And let's just sing very briefly. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this very special time of year. And Lord, I pray your blessing upon each household represented here tonight, Lord. God, I pray your blessing, Lord, that, that this Christmas season not just, be, not just be fun and great to be, but Lord, that it truly be blessed by you. God, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus Christ, for the Son of God born into this world to die for us. We give you praise. Father, we love you. We praise you. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. And God, again, I pray your blessing upon your people. In Jesus' name, amen. And again, Merry Christmas.